Hello, welcome to Parents, Families, and Friends. I'm Paul Clifford, and this program is brought to you by Parents, Families, and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. We call it PFLAG for short. You can find out more about the organization at www.pflag.org. That's www.pflag.org. This program is dedicated to the issues that gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people face, and the issues that those who love them also face in defending their rights, in advocating for their civil liberties, and in protecting and loving them. We've often talked with kids on this program about bullying in schools. This evening, we're going to talk with a, an openly gay educator, someone who came out at some point in his teaching career, about the issue of bullying in schools and his also his personal evolution in coming out and addressing those issues. I'd like to welcome you, uh, Ron, Ron Schmidt, to the program today. Thank you, Paul. Now, I see you've written this, this memoir, Once Removed, uh, and I was, I was just browsing through it, and it deals with everything. <laughs> it's it's a, a personal story about your coming out and your, your evolution, about uh, your fight with alcoholism, about your relationship with your family, about bullying in schools, about your work to make school systems safer for, for kids who are bullied. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure where to begin, but let me, let me ask you a little bit about your upbringing. You were, you were a closeted gay kid. When did you, you figure out that you were gay, and when did you first tell anyone that you were gay? Well, Paul, I, uh, I figured out very, very early that my uh, reactions to men uh, were more like my sister's reactions to men and <laughs> my reaction to women, you know, uh, not like my brothers. He, he, he was relating to, to uh, women. The basic situation is I knew very early that I couldn't talk about this. And um, I was raised a Catholic uh, in a very Catholic Irish family. Schmidt is my, is my father's name and my name. But my father was sort of subsumed in a, an Irish Catholic uh, matriarchy in our home. Mm -hmm. Here in South, or in San Jose, and so um, that's how I began my existence. And I went all through Catholic schools: Sacred Heart Grammar School, Bellarmine uh, College Preparatory, and Santa Clara University. I was even at the at the uh, novitiate, Sacred Heart novitiate, the Jesuit novitiate, for a short period of time. And, and you knew you were gay all through this upbringing, but you never I told was, anyone. I was terrified. I was gay. I was terrified of being gay. I never had anyone confirm it for me, and I had not acted on it uh, during those early years. By the time I got into college, that was that was different. But uh, but um, I would go to confessors, and my confessors actually said to me on occasion, "Don't worry about these things. Once you get married, it'll take care of itself." Right. Right. And uh, so, well, this I, story is very familiar to me. Uh -huh. um, growing up Irish yes. Catholic yeah. and a little bit of Italian Catholic too. Yeah. <laughs> I got yeah. a double dose of it yeah. <laughs> from the two most Catholic countries in the world. Exactly. Um, and terrified that I was gay mm -hmm. all through uh, middle school and high mm -hmm. school, uh, but certainly not telling anyone about mm -hmm. it and uh, living in fear that anyone would ever find out. Mm -hmm. um, but then even talking about sex was kind of taboo. Sex was something. Of um, course. Uh, that you never even mentioned. It was something so vile and dirty and disgusting, you only did it with someone you loved. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so that was the Catholic attitude, and I never broke out of that until many, many years later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. I understand, yeah. yeah. But I didn't get married, and you did. I did. I was desperate to change. What I began to understand about being gay was very fearful to me. There was a gay man in St. Mary's Parish where I, was, where I grew up, and in San Jose, and uh, he was very odd. Mm -hmm. In the book, I, I refer to him as poor, odd Claude, and uh, uh, that's how my family spoke of him. And he was actually the secretary uh, to the uh, uh, vice principal at Santa Clara University, and uh, one day it came out in the newspaper that he had been arrested for propositioning a student at Santa Clara University, and uh, so everybody. So that, so that was your only role model. <laughs> that was my only role model, yeah. That was my only role model. And yet I had these definite needs and inclinations, and I didn't know how to deal with them. 
I was advised um, by one of the uh, intellectual elite uh, on the staff at Santa Clara, uh, the Jesuits. Um, he said to me, when I went to him and said that I think I'm skirting the edges of homosexuality and I don't know what to do about it, he said, he said, well, if you are in, indeed a homosexual, you know whose fault it is, don't you? Your dear devoted parents. And <laughs> he gave me the name of a psychiatrist to whom I went for the next two years to get myself straight. And I wanted desperately to be straight. Um, I did not want to be like poor odd Claude. And, uh, and that's where that went. Um, toward the end of my uh, two years in psychotherapy, I met the woman I would eventually marry. I loved her, there's no question about it. She was a wonderful, uh, beautiful young woman, uh, Catholic also from San Francisco. And um, um, I, my, my therapist had told me, there's a 50-50 chance of you becoming straight if you want it badly enough. And I believed I was and I married and um, it shouldn't have happened that way. But I, I have two wonderful sons um, from that marriage. Uh, the marriage ended in divorce. Um, and I raised my sons myself from the time the youngest was three. Oh, wow. And uh, so I got by by drinking, hugely, hugely uh, impacted by drinking. And uh, she had, my wife had become mentally ill. I believed I had caused that illness because I wasn't man enough for her. Um, and uh, uh, so the, the, the alcohol became my uh, elixir to, to get by. And uh, that's, how, that's how that happened. There's, there are so many uh, gay men, uh, particularly my age and a little older, who, who did get married in, in large part because they felt they could change by practicing hard enough to be heterosexual, by praying hard enough to be heterosexual, by marrying the right person, or whatever the reason. Um, the unfortunate tragedy is all the authorities around them, the church, legal system, the uh, psychotherapist, yeah. all pointed them in that direction and said, look, you can do this. Yeah. But I've never heard of a case in which it really worked. No, no, neither have I. And uh, indeed, it, it, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that it does not. <clears throat> but. Um, in any event, uh, as I said, my sons and I were alone for the rest of those years, and uh, it was by drinking that I got by. No one suspected that I had a problem. This is one of the one of the really strange. Well, my sons did because they were living with me, right. so they they saw me every night as I came home from school and so forth, and began to drink and. And uh, it was it was a dreadful kind of situation. I signed myself into it, into a three-week program in, in Puget Sound General, uh, in Washington, in Tacoma, Washington, and uh, uh, very very hopeful that I was going to finally be able to uh, uh, master the alcohol. And uh, I had by this time begun, of course. Uh, accessing certain areas of the uh, gay community in Seattle and Tacoma, Seattle basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, I was in the, when I was in the recovery program, I confided to one of the counselors there, a man, very large, uh, wonderfully warm-hearted man uh, called Hugh Long, and they called him the Red Bear because of his size and his red hair <laughs> and beard. And I confided that I was I'm gay, and uh, he said, "Ron, stand up," and uh, I did. And he came over to me, and he put his arms around me, and he said, "Thank you for being." And no one had ever said anything like that to me before, and I was so deeply touched. Um, and that was the first you'd come out to anyone. Yeah, essentially, yes. That's remarkable. And uh, and uh, so. I came out of that program, and uh, within three weeks I was drinking again. And uh, I, uh, I uh, refer to that in my book also. May I read sure. just a bit? Yep. Uh, <laughs> I had had a, uh, 
a PK, a preacher's kid, was babysitting my kids while I, while I went to Seattle and accessed the baths. And uh, I will say that the baths were my salvation. They were, really? They how, were how my so? salvation. So, so the baths, we're talking about at the time, what were sex clubs? Sex clubs, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, the basic thing is that it was there that I began to realize for the first time <sighs> what it was like to be able to hold another man, to touch another man, to feel his need and be, have my need experienced and felt too. And that it was much more than just sex. It was so much more. And uh, anyway, I say here, uh, the preacher's kid had just shut the door and headed down the alley. Drake, my oldest son, poked his head into the kitchen and the instant the ice cubes hit the glass, what are you doing, he asked, alarmed at the blue labeled walkers on the sideboard. What does it look like? Don't, his sneakers squeaked against the linoleum. Just leave me alone, it's all right. Not if you're going to drink again, it's not. He grabbed the glass from the counter and spilled the contents into the sink. God damn it, Drake, leave me alone. If you pour it all out, I'll just have to buy more, don't you understand? And we can't afford that. He watched me expressionless. I could hear Tracy scrambling out of the bean bag on the living room floor. My voice was edged with desperation. Look, it didn't work, I'm sorry. The hospital or AA, neither of them worked. Call the red bear guy, Tracy pleaded from the doorway. I turned from them both, poured more gin and gulped it down. Dad, Tracy said, beginning to cry. I shook my head, feeling the surge in my blood, the warmth expanding in my chest. I refilled the glass and swallowed the undiluted gin so that when I turned to them, it wouldn't matter. And that's what my sons had to live with. That's a really sad and frightening for, portrait of alcoholism. A frightening portrait of alcoholism. It was my first lover, my first gay lover, who helped me to get a handle on that. And I met him at the water garden in San Jose. Really? Yes. And uh, again, it was much more than about, than about sex. Of course, that was involved. So he set you on the road to recovery. He, he was the one who helped me to value myself as a gay human being. And, uh, and, and uh, as I, I say, talked me down from the glasses of gin at my lips. And gradually, as I began to gain my sobriety, um, it became necessary for me to be honest about who I am and to come out. I had been teaching since Tacoma, as I said, and uh, so um, I also came out as a teacher, as a gay teacher, and that was in Morgan Hill Unified, mm -hmm. uh, right adjacent to San Jose, south of San Jose. The last 15 years of my career were, were in Morgan Hill Unified. Um, people were astonished that I was, that I was uh, an alcoholic. Uh -huh. um, they were more astonished that I was gay, particularly in Morgan Hill and as a teacher coming out. So this process of coming out and s dealing with being gay, finally, is what pushed you into sobriety. Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. Remarkable. So, so now you're a gay teacher, an openly gay teacher, but this was, was quite a while ago. Was it safe to be an openly gay teacher? I mean, I, I've heard stories of, of people trying to come out or coming out and just being fired from their jobs all over California. Yes, and, and that's absolutely true. Um, I lost a job. Uh, I was teaching, teaching in another district in San Jose for a year uh, and expecting to be rehired the next year. In fact, old I would be, but I had, uh, I had uh, uh, gone to my first parade in San Francisco, the Gay Pride Parade in San Francisco, and uh, had written a letter to the editor of the San Jose Mercury because of their shoddy coverage of the parade. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, when my letter was published. The school district suddenly said, gee, we, we overestimated our need for next year. We're not going to oh need you after all. And I was told by an assistant principal with whom I uh, met after, after I had been hired at Morgan Hill Unified. I said, I think it's because I'm, I wrote that letter. And she said, yes, it was. But if you ever say that to anybody, I will, I will deny it. She also said, Mr. Schmidt, I have never understood the need for gay people to say that they are gay. 
And I looked at her and I said to her, a lovely uh, African-American woman, I said, Barbara, you don't need to have to tell, you don't need to tell people that you are African-American, that you are black. But I said, you know that in the, in the faculty rooms, there are so many jokes periodically, innuendos about being gay and so forth. I said, that's why it's important. We need to be right. able to be who we are. And so um, that's, that's what happened. So C CTA, California Teachers Association, and California Federation of Teachers both backed me when I came out in Morgan Hill Unified. And um, so that's how you retained your job that's because how of the I unions. My job, yes. And uh, I came out specifically during my first semester uh, there as a temporary teacher in Morgan Hill Unified because of the, the suicide of a an eighth grade girl at the other middle school, uh -huh. and um, um, the the district had called out a uh, psychiatrist from the county office of education, county health department, I should say and uh, had him come and speak to people, in, uh, to the uh, teachers in their various school di schools. And, um, um, you know, he didn't tell any of us anything we didn't already know, except that he did not take night calls, okay? That's, that's <laughs> nowhere. I went to the principal the next day, and I said, if that's supposed to be dealing with the issue, it was like putting a, a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. And I said, Tremendous numbers of these kids who commit suicide are, in fact, dealing with sexual identity uh, uh, issues. And uh, I said, it's entirely possible that this child was lesbian, uh, thinking she was lesbian, whatever the case. And I said, I know this because I am myself gay. He mouth dropped and he slapped his, his shoe and his foot and he said, if that were to become generally known in this district, it would bring down the walls of the district. And he forbade <laughs> me to ever talk about it. And um, I, uh, I thought that was assigning an awful lot of power to me. Yes, forbidding someone from talking about something is not the right thing to do to an <laughs> activist. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I did, I continued to talk about it. And I, again, got support from both, both teachers unions. Um, and so that when I, when I first said the GNL words in a district meeting, the oxygen literally evaporated from the room. You right. could just feel it. Right. And, it was uh, completely taboo to say the words gay or lesbian yes, exactly. in, in any sort of educational setting. Exactly. And, you know, um, after a while, it was expected that if I was in a meeting, I was going to be raising this issue because <laughs> I was also pressing for the need to bring awareness training about these issues, about these kids to our district. And eventually you did that. You did, you did bring uh, awareness training to all the teachers in the district yes. on, uh, to make them aware of the existence of the gay and lesbian kids in the classroom and also mm -hmm. to make them aware of the bullying that goes on. Yes, but I had gained tremendous support from PFLAG also. I was, I was also a member of the Bay Area Network of Gay and Lesbian Educators. In fact, I co-founded that and uh, uh, Rob Burley, wonderful, wonderful young teacher who f was a co-founder of Bangle overall. Uh -huh. um, uh, and, and so Bay Area Network of Gay and Le pardon me, Bangle, Bay Area Network of Gay and Lesbian Educators and PFLAG, we, we joined uh, forces. And uh, Ann Davidson in particular, um, uh, a PFLAG mother with whom I began to develop the idea of a workshop, and we titled this The Invisible Minority in Our Schools, Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgendered Youth. And um, we took it throughout Santa Clara County. We went to every school district office, and we were, uh, we were successful at persuading them to allow us to come in to do these workshops. Um, this was, Little more challenging at Morgan Hill. In fact, when I went to the school board meeting to propose this, there were 400 people at the meeting, and uh, half of them were foaming at the mouth conservatives, and uh, uh, they were spouting the worst possible kinds of stereotypes about gays. 
and uh, um, we had to actually move that meeting, my presentation, to the next uh, board meeting because it ran to midnight, and I still wow. there, there were still <laughs> too many people. So, what actually happened at these these workshops given for the teachers? I mean, what what did you do to to uh, sensitize them to the the issues of gay and lesbian kids in their classes? What we did uh, essentially was to um, we was we we were we were bringing together panels. We had a panel of parents. And uh, these were parents from the school district itself. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it was PFLAG parents. And we had a panel of, of students and uh, as much as possible from the district itself. And that was very challenging for kids to be able to take that kind oh, of yes. risk. Were they mostly students who were currently in school or those that had been out a couple years? Some, <laughs> were, some were currently in and some, some were uh, uh, former students. And uh, so that was, that was tremendously important. And we presented them to the audience. We had uh, uh, administrators and counselors and teachers, and uh, we wanted to get to all of the students as well. That was more problematic. But uh, eventually, Morgan Hill uh, decided they would let us do this, and we did. And uh, we thought that we had made very, very significant progress um, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, particular situations was a young a student who had been in my class in the ninth grade had Morgan mm -hmm. Hill Unified mm -hmm. and and uh, I asked her would she be able to come and speak at the at this uh, workshop and she said yes she had told me about her own experience at the high school and even at the junior high. And uh, she spoke to the administrators and counselors who were assembled in the board boardroom meeting. And uh, she, was, she was very, very intense and tense. And she said, I was in one class at the, at the junior high where the teacher set aside the entire lesson plan and let kids hurl epithets around the whole period. And they said faggot and dyke and, and all of these different words. And she said, I was so afraid they were going to look at me and say, you're one of them, aren't you? And she burst into tears at that point and she said, where were you? Where were you? And Paul, there wasn't a sound in that room. There wasn't a sound in that room except this girl's sobs. And it was so incredibly moving. And uh, I, I moved next to her and put my hand on her shoulder and I handed her my clean handkerchief and so she could dry her tears. And, and um, she gave that back to me and I never washed that. I took it with me to every workshop I ever did <laughs> afterwards to remind myself of what my purpose was in there. being there. And it was truly a relic. Yeah, and, I I mean, it's a tragedy that, that students uh, who are bullied or who feel uncomfortable in classes in their schools can't exactly. speak directly to their teachers at the time. Exactly. It's only with a couple exactly. years of space yeah. and, and that they've grown up a bit and become articulate that they can never, you know, talk with their teachers. Exactly. But then uh, you, you had to provide the setting. Yeah. But then, you know, we thought we had made so much progress. And uh, a couple of years after that, I received a phone call during a teacher uh, work day between semesters, and it was from Alana Flores, and a uh, very, very courageous young woman. She had graduated the previous uh, spring from uh, Live Oak High School in Morgan mm -hmm. Hill. And she said, I was told I should call you. And she said she and five other students had been mercilessly harassed during their their right. period of time in the high school. And I met with her and she told me all of what had happened and she said they were, when she and these other students were sitting at lunch in the quad, other students would come along and throw straight porn magazines at them and say, here's how it's supposed to be done. And uh, the word dyke was scratched on her locker and things of this kind. So it's just a barrage of sexual harassment. Harassment, harassment, and this is it, you see. We called it harassment in that 
time, and today it's called bullying. It's the mm -hmm. same thing, obviously. Right, right. But I said to her, Alana, we've done the talking. We've been to the board. If you're still experiencing these kinds of problems, the only thing they'll listen to is a lawsuit. lawsuit. And if you want me to, I will take you to an attorney and to the ACLU. She said, absolutely. So that was the origin of the lawsuit against the Morgan Hill School That's District. Right. That's and right. that resulted eventually in a verdict. It did. But it took six years six for that year, Six years later. Okay. Yeah. The <laughs> okay. district dragged its feet saying they but didn't know this was happening. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals finally said, if you didn't know, you ought to have known there was plenty of evidence. And they said the lawsuit could proceed. At that point, the district settled for $1.1 million. It was the largest amount ever accorded to any, any such case. And wow. one would think that other districts would say, look what's right. happened here. We need to get our act together. Yeah. But it has continued. Right, right. Have things gotten well, better? They have, but yeah. only. Well, we've interviewed students for whom it, it has not gotten better, yeah. but we've also interviewed students for whom it really has gotten better. So, yeah. you know, it's always two steps forward and one step back in this kind of process. I want to thank you so much, Ron, for joining us. Thank you very and, much, um, We'll have to have you on again so that you can tell us more stories about how to you know, address bullying in the schools. This book, okay. Once Removed, with a hyphen, Once Removed, is available at local bookstores. It's also available at Amazon.com. When I go to Amazon, I read the uh, reviews, and this one got some pretty good reviews. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Paul. And thank you also for joining us. Please join us again.